In this video, we're going to talk about another application of exponential and logarithmic functions, and that application concerns Lake Cordalin, which is in Idaho, USA. It's a beautiful vacation spot. It is a very common um, attraction amongst the locals, as well as people from the outside of the state. Um, but it has also been a site of mining activity since the early 1900s, when deposits of silver were discovered in the vicinity of the lake. Now, once the ground or the mineral rich soil has been processed, whatever was remaining of it was dumped directly into the lake, as you can see here. Starting from early 1900s, an estimated 75 million metric tons of sediment have been dumped into the lake. Now, of course, some of it has traveled down the river, but a lot of it had settled at the bottom of the lake. A number of cleanup operations have actually taken place where the entire river was diverted artificially in order for the bottom of the lake to be exposed and therefore cleaned. Um, it has also allowed um, for unique opportunity for researchers to study how the sediment occurs naturally, how it settles naturally, as well as together with the man-made activity. Now, the way that the sediment is studied is one takes a column of measurement from the bottom of the lake. So you literally insert this in this case glass, generally it's actually metal column. And you can see different layers of ground being collected from the bottom of the lake. Now, the next question of course is how do you time those? So how do you know, for example, that this particular layer corresponds to a particular year? And the biologists here have a couple of tricks up their sleeve. So for example, they use big historical events um, that resulted in some kind of ecological impact. Um, if you all remember the explosion of Mount St. Helen, the volcano in Washington state happened in 1980 and created a big cloud of volcanic ash. Now this ash can be traced to a certain depth of sediment and therefore you can certainly claim that that depth corresponds to the year 18, 1980. Same with uh, radioactive, um, various radioactive sediments that occurred um, through some testing or disasters such as a Chernobyl disaster. So all in all, researchers have actually been able to come up with a formula that describes the depth of the sediment and it is given by this particular function. Um, notice here that the time T corresponds to years prior to 1990. So year 1990 is zero and as T increases, the time actually moves backwards. It is important in word problems to pause for a minute before you start doing any math or arithmetic and actually understand what the function represents. So for example, here, t, if I plug in t equals zero, I'm going to get, this is gonna turn into one, one minus one is zero, so the whole thing is zero. So the year 1990 or the year zero corresponds to the very top of that column. If I plug in, for example, 20 here, what I have is at what depth are we looking for the sediment that occurred 20 years before 1990? So as you plug in the year, the function will give you the depth at which you have to look at in order to see the sediment that occurred in that year. Okay, so the first thing here is to find and interpret d of 20. So of course, this one is fairly straightforward. We simply plug in 20 into our function here and we can plug the entire thing into the calculator or let's say Wolfram Alpha, and it will give us a number that is approximately 36.2. Um, we're gonna look back at our units, it's measured in centimeters. So that means that 20 years before 1990, which is of course 1970, the sediment that we're looking at is 30, 6.2 centimeters below the surface. So at 36.2 centimeters, this is the level that corresponds to the year 1970. What year does sedimentation of 50 centimeters below the surface corresponds to? So this question is like the reverse of the previous one. We're given the actual depth, so we're looking at 50 centimeters below the surface, and we're wondering what year was that sediment occurring at? So here, the depth is 50, and we are, in fact, after the value of t. Notice that t only occurs in one spot in this entire equation, so we can solve for it using logarithmic functions. Once before, I think I've said that 
please try to first isolate the term that contains t and then take logarithms as that will actually make the calculations simpler. So here I would move 155 over at first, so divide both sides by 155. That way they will cancel, then move um, one over, then you can take logarithms, and in the end you should get the value for t as approximately 29. Now t is in years before 1990, so 29 years before 1990. I should have also pointed out that the reason that t equals zero corresponds to 1990 is because this research actually took place in 1990 and that's when this function was modeled. Um, after that there was a significant change in mining operations as well as the cleanup operations of the lake, so no matter what function you come up with afterwards will actually have to be a separate branch of this, of this function. Let's take a look at other parts. Now we're asked to find and interpret the limit as t goes to infinity of our function. So first of all, let's consider this limit. We have 155, one minus e to the negative power. Um, you can analyze this directly or you can rewrite the negative power as the reciprocal and it might be slightly easier to see the actual, um, the actual nature of the function. So it's one minus one over e to the point zero one three three t. So now as t goes to infinity, this term will go to infinity. One over a very large number becomes a very small power, which means that this entire term goes to zero. And then what we have left is 155 times one minus zero, so that's equal to 155. This is once again in centimeters. This is as time goes to infinity. So as we go further and further back in time, this is the depth at which the sediment is located. So that means that back in time, back if we go on forever, the sediment that we're looking at is about 155 centimeters below the surface, okay? So the lowest sediment here is 155 centimeters, and that corresponds to probably when the lake was actually formed. Next, we are asked to find and interpret the derivative of this depth function. So here, let's take a look at how it's composed. It's 155 times something. So you can apply the product rule, but 155 is a constant, so it's better to apply constant multiple rule. We're going to leave the constant alone, and we're going to take a derivative of whatever is in the bracket. The derivative of 1 is 0, so I'm going to write that in, minus, and then it's the derivative of e to the negative power. Remember, the derivative of e to anything is just itself, so I can rewrite that, times the derivative of its inside, which in this case, of course, is just the power. So the derivative of that is simply the coefficient in front of it, minus 0 0.0133. Okay, and then if you simplify this out, you will notice that you get 155 times 0 0.0133 e to the negative power that it was at the very beginning. So notice that this minus and this minus actually become a plus and this whole thing has a positive coefficient in front of it. Next part, between 1900 and 1990, which means between t equals zero and t equals 100, you are asked when is the sedimentation settling the fastest? I'm going to leave this question up to you to ponder about what it is that you actually want to maximize here and how in fact to do so. For a final part here, we're asked to sketch the entire function. We already have the first derivative, so we're going to run the first derivative analysis, take the second derivative, run the second derivative analysis, think about the asymptotes and the other intercepts. Okay, so as the first derivative from the last page, we have 155, I'm actually gonna leave it like this, I'm not gonna compute it as a separate number, uh, three, three, e to the negative of the same power, Critical points is when the derivative is zero or does not exist. So let's look for those. The derivative is zero and when it's a product, when one of the factors is zero. Obviously the numbers here are not zero, so I'm looking for when is this zero. And we've discussed this earlier, e to any power is not negative, which means that the derivative being zero produces no solutions. The next case we have to consider for critical points is when does the derivative not exist? And it's the same thing here. We can plug any number in. So this also produces no solutions. 
That means that this function has no critical points. No local minimal, no local maximum, nothing like that. That doesn't mean that we cannot run the first derivative analysis on it. It's going to be a boring number line, but it can be number line nonetheless. So there's no critical points I can put on it, which means that the entire number line is one big interval from negative infinity to infinity. I can still analyze the derivative and the function behavior on it though. That means that I can plug in any number into the, any number from in negative infinity to infinity into the derivative to see whether it's going to be positive or negative. That makes sense too, right? Because this number here, as per our discussion, will in fact always be positive. This is a positive number and e to any power is always positive. So the derivative is positive for all numbers, which means that the function is increasing on its entire domain from negative infinity to infinity. Speaking about the second derivative, so taking the second derivative function, I can apply a similar rule as before, where this is just a constant, so I can rewrite this. 155 times 0 0.0133 times the derivative of the exponential function, which is itself, times the derivative of the inside. And the derivative of inside is going to be just that coefficient of the power. Here, the situation is very similar to before. I'm going to look for when the second derivative is zero, and I'm going to actually come up with the exact same conclusion because my second derivative here is once again, just a number times e to some power. That's never zero, so I have no solutions here. And unsurprisingly, I'm also going to get no solutions for when the second derivative does not exist. That means that the function has no potential inflection points, so whatever concavity it has, it has over its entire domain. So once again, just so that this looks in line with all of the other examples that we did, we can draw the second derivative analysis number line and plug in any number on the integral from infinity, the from negative infinity to infinity into the second derivative. You notice here that the situation changed slightly because now I have this minus sign in front of the coefficient. So no matter what I plug in, the second derivative will be negative, which means that the function will be concave down on its entire domain. Um, the other things that we normally compute are x and y intercepts, which in this case are going to be just the origin, as well as the asymptotes. For vertical asymptotes, I'm not gonna have any here because there's no, there's no number which will make this function go to infinity at. For horizontal asymptotes, we've actually computed that on the previous slide where we took the limit as t goes to infinity of our function and it turned out to be 155. So 155 is our horizontal asymptote. Some of the useful numbers that I probably want to compute the, um, the function value at are absent. Normally I would plug in critical points and inflection points, but here I have none. If you want to put some numbers on the board though, we've also computed them a couple of slides ago here. So for example, I know that at 20, the depth was 36.2. So at 0.20, I have 36.2. And from the previous, oh no, from the, that slide again, I also know that 29 years before 1990, the depth was 50. So here, at least I have some numbers that I can ground myself onto when making the graph. Pause the video here, sketch the graph using all of this information and see if you can come up with something similar to mine in a second. So you should get something like this which converges to its horizontal asymptote, starts at the origin and goes through the two points that we have in the actual uh, values for. It is always increasing and it's always concave down, which is in line with our first and second derivative analysis. Notice that my scale here is not quite right. Otherwise the graph would look a little bit wonky. So I put this little bit of a squishy axis here. Um, this is also a really great way of trying to sell the wrong statistics, trying to lie with statistics if you actually mess with a scale on one of the axes. So watch out for that. Um, this is a very standard process by which these graphs or any graph in calculus will be analyzed. So please notice how we didn't change anything about the process of sketching or first or second derivative analysis. We simply are now operating with different functions within the same framework. Once we get to trigonometric functions, this is gonna be the same thing again, where the process will not change, but the functions will be different. Sandwiched between the applications here, I'm going to introduce one last technique of differentiation that we're gonna see in this course. And a good example to consider to motivate this is the function 
y equals x to power x. So notice that in this function, we have x in the base and x in the exponent, which is not something that we have seen before and not necessarily something that we have actually developed rules for. We already know how to take rules of power functions. Of course, this is your power rule. The power comes down and you reduce it by one is what's going to give you the derivative of something like this. We've also, in the previous lectures, seen how to take derivatives of exponential functions. In particular, for example, if this is e or if this is some other constant, we're going to have that the derivative is itself times natural logarithm of the base. So here we have a function that only has the variable in the base but has a constant in the power. And here we have a function that has a constant in the base but variable in the power. What do we do if we have variable in both spots? Do we apply one of these rules or do we apply neither? And the answer, of course, is neither because these rules were specifically developed to only work in the case where either the base or the power itself is constant. So if we don't have a rule to take a derivative of something that has the power in both the base and the power, then what do we do? Now, the conundrum here really is the fact that we would actually really like to not have both, and therefore we can think about ways to bring the x from the power down to the bottom. And the way to do that, of course, is by taking logarithms. So if I start with y equals x to power x, what happens if I take this entire expression and apply a logarithm to both sides? Now, this allows me to simplify the expression on the right-hand side, specifically to actually bring the power down. So on the left, I'm going to still have ln of y, but on the right, the power comes down to the front, and then I have ln of x. Now that I no longer have this issue of having the variable in the base and the variable in the power, I can take this entire expression and take a derivative of that with respect to x. And here is where we're going to have to think about the different types of tools that we have developed. So on the left-hand side, I'm going to take a derivative with respect to x of the function ln of y. I don't know what y is, well, rather I actually do, it's dependent on x. So this is going to be the case of my implicit differentiation. My outside function is the logarithm. So first of all, my derivative is going to be 1 over the inside, which is just y, followed by the derivative of the inside. The derivative of y is y prime. And on the right-hand side, it's actually much more straightforward. Here, I simply have a product, so I'm going to apply a product rule. Applying product rule to x ln x, what do I have? First, I take a derivative of x, which is just 1, times ln of x plus I leave x alone times the derivative of ln of x, which is just 1 over x. Now, of course, I notice that I can cancel these x's out. And remember that what I'm really after is the derivative of y. So this y prime is what I actually would like to know. Now, if I simply multiply both sides by y, I will be able to cancel it on the left-hand side, producing the expression for y prime. So simplifying this further will give me that I have y times ln of x plus 1, right? Don't forget I've canceled these x's, which results in just this 1 right here. And I can actually leave this expression as is, but I can also go back and replace the y with the expression in terms of x that I have for it. So y is actually x to power x and then ln x plus 1. And there we have it. I have myself a derivative of y all in terms of x. So the method is if you have the variable in the base and in the power, we're going to apply logarithms to both sides, simplify to get rid of the fact that we have x's in both spots, and then apply implicit differentiation to actually find the derivative. This is what's called logarithmic differentiation, of course, because I've taken the logarithm before I differentiate. So let's see how this works on a few other examples. The standard case for use is as before. If I have a function that has x in the base and x in the power, there are no other tools other than logarithmic differentiation to actually take a derivative of this. So my first step will be to take the logarithm, 
My second step will be to simplify, and my third step will be to take a derivative, minding the fact that this is now an implicit differentiation process. So I encourage you to pause the video here and try these steps by yourself. So first up, I'm going to take the logarithm of both sides. So on the left-hand side, I'll have ln of y, and on the right-hand side, I have logarithm of 3x minus 1 to the power of 5x. Next up, I'm going to simplify to get rid of this issue of having x in the base and in the power. So my simplification step will take the power of the entire inside and bring it down to in front of the logarithm. So in this case, I'm going to end up with this, right? So this was my simplify step. And now I'm going to proceed to differentiate step. And again, though, I have to be mindful of the fact that I'm taking the derivative of this entire expression with respect to x, but my left-hand side is implicitly defined. So the derivative of the left-hand side is 1 over the inside times the derivative of the inside as per implicit differentiation or the chain rule. And on the right-hand side, I once again have a product rule, except for now my parts are just a little bit more complicated than on the last slide. So the derivative of 5x is 5 followed by ln of 3x minus 1, plus I leave 5x alone and take a derivative of ln of 3x minus 1. The derivative of a logarithm is, again, remember, 1 over the inside, so 1 over 3x minus 1. But then here, my inside of the logarithm isn't just x. So chain rule kicks in, and I have to take a derivative of the inside. The derivative of 3x minus 1 is simply 3. And here is sort of my entire expression after I've taken a derivative. Now, I'm not quite done yet because I have taken a derivative, but I haven't really solved for the derivative itself, right? I would like my final answer to really be y prime equals and then something. So here, in the next step, I'm going to solve exactly for that. I'm going to multiply both sides by y so I can get rid of this y here. And because I can combine the two steps together, these are not very complicated steps, I know that my y is actually this entire expression. So here, I'm going to first of all have 3x minus 1 all to power 5x which stands for my y, followed by this whole thing that I've inherited from the previous line. You know what? Being a little bit more efficient, because I can, I am simply going to take this expression and rewrite this here. Okay? So once again, this came from the fact that I multiplied both sides by y, and that is my expression for y, and this whole thing simply got moved down as a factor. Now, the other use case for logarithmic differentiation is not when we have x in the base and x in the power, but rather when we have a very complicated uh, function that consists of products and quotients. If I were to take a derivative of this function as written, I would have to apply quotient rule followed by the product rule followed by a few um, chain rules, it will take me quite some time to get through all of those steps. But instead, what I can do is apply similar techniques here. I'm going to take logarithms of both sides, remembering that as per logarithmic rules, they will allow me to quite effectively simplify products and quotients as well as powers. So now, I can simplify the right-hand side and get rid of all of those things. So on the left-hand side, I'm still going to have ln of y. But on the right-hand side, I'm going to recall off to the side here a few logarithmic rules. So first of all, I can recall that the logarithm of a product, let me call it, let's say, a times b, is actually a sum of logarithms. So I will have ln of a plus ln of b. I can also recall that if I have a quotient, then what I get is actually ln of a minus ln of b. And then, of course, the rule that I've already used, if I have a power, then I can bring that power down in front of the logarithm. Keeping these rules in mind, take a minute and see if you can simplify this expression to be just the sum and difference 
and the product with the constant of the different logarithms. So take this right hand side and simplify it as far as you can. Okay, so working with the right hand side, what am I going to get? I'm going to get the logarithm of e to the 2x plus logarithm of root 4x plus 5 minus logarithm of x minus 1 cubed, right? I only applied the first two rules. This was a product, so it turned into a sum, and this was the quotient, so it turned into a difference. Now I can apply this rule of bringing the power down in the front. So I can simplify everything even further down. If you still have powers on top of your things, you have not simplified them as far as you possibly could have. And remember, simplifying is easier than differentiating. So we will try to simplify as far as we can before actually taking the derivative. So what do we have here? 2x will come down. So I will have 2x times ln of e. But ln of e is just 1. So it's 2x times 1. So this is really nothing. I can get rid of that. Plus, recall that square root is a power of 1 half. So this is 1 half times ln of 4x plus 5. Now this, you have to leave as is. There's no rule that allows you to break up a logarithm of a sum. So I am stuck with this as the simplest of the expressions. And this 3 can also come down here. So I can have minus 3 times ln of x minus 1. Excellent. Now that I have an expression that includes only the sums, the differences, and the constants, I'm actually going to take this whole thing and take a derivative of that. Okay, let me make a little bit of room for myself here so I can fit that all in the same slide. So having simplified that, let's take a derivative. So on the left hand side, much like above, I'm going to have 1 over y times y prime. And on the right hand side, I don't have any applications of product rule or quotient rule. All I have are a series of fairly straightforward derivatives. So the derivative of 2x is 2. Then I have 1 half times the derivative of ln of 4x plus 5. So 1 over the inside times the derivative of the inside minus 3 times the derivative of ln of x minus 1. So 1 over x minus 1. And really, I'm basically done. I'm not going to write out the last step, mostly because I'm out of room, really. But what you're doing is, as before, multiplying both sides by y and getting yourself an expression for y prime. So if you ever, again, see expressions that are really too bulky and something that seems a little too tragic to take a derivative of as is, think about the different ways to simplify it first. And if the expression you have contains only products and quotients as well as powers, then logarithmic differentiation is the way to go. Now that we can take derivatives of all kinds of things, let's get back to a few application examples. So the first one here is logistic growth example. Um, we have a function given to us by this expression that describes the bird flu that Paul has encountered in his chickens. Paul was a friend of mine that actually had chickens at the time. And he's, of course, trying to stop the epidemic. He, being a mathematician, describes the number or tracks the number of his chickens being sick and notices that this function is modeling the outbreak fairly closely. Now, we call it logistic growth because of the general shape of the function. So you always have a constant on the top, a constant um, summoned here, a constant multiple, and e to some power at the bottom here. We're simply asked to not construct the model, but analyze the information that it provides. So for example, how many chickens got sick when the epidemic began? So the epidemic begins at time t equals zero. So all we're asked to compute here is p of zero. If I plug in zero in for t, I notice of course that the power here is gonna be zero, which will make the entire e to power zero equal to one. So altogether, I'm going to have 300 divided by five plus 20, which, if you put together, is going to give you 12. So at the beginning of the epidemic, there were 12 chickens that were sick. Next up, how many, in how many weeks will 30 chickens be sick? So this is the number of chickens that are sick in T weeks after the initial outbreak. We're asked for when, so 
for what value of t is this number going to be equal to 30. So I simply have to set this to be 30 and solve it for t, which is, of course, not even a, a calculus skill, but rather involves manipulating the exponential functions and solving for what's in the exponents, so utilizing uh, logarithmic functions as the inverses of them. So feel free to take a minute here and actually try to do this for yourself. The first step is actually kind of probably the hardest because you have to somehow figure out what to do with the fact that the right-hand side is a fraction. Now you can imagine that this is 30 over 1 and then you can simply cross multiply and go from there. So this expression is equivalent to 30 times 5 plus 20 e to the minus 0.7t equaling 300. If I open up the brackets here and shift around the constants, my expression in the next step or so is going to be equal to 20 e to the minus 0.7t equals to 5. From here on, I can divide both sides by 20, solve for t, and I should get in just a couple of short steps that t is approximately 19.8 and it's measured in weeks. So that means that we started off with 12 chickens being sick and in 20 weeks, we're going to have 30 chickens that are sick. If we were um, deciding that we're probably going to want to visualize how the epidemic spreads, we can actually start already sketching this. So I know that at the very beginning, at zero weeks, I had 12 chickens that were sick. In 20 weeks, I will have 30 chickens that are sick. So I will have a point on my graph here. And let's see what this last question is asking. What is the maximum number of chickens that will become ill? Well, maximum number of chicken means as time goes on, what is this value approaching? So I'm going to have to take the limit of P of T as T goes off to infinity. So again, mathematically, it makes sense. Um, in real life, it just means sort of end behavior. We, we are not going to count what's going to happen to the chickens at the end of time, but we are letting time to go to infinity to understand what is going to happen in the long run. Now, t is only present in the exponent here. So really, when I'm sending t off to infinity, I have to be thinking of what happens to this expression right here. If t becomes a very, very large number, e to the negative very, very large number approaches zero. So overall, my expression is going to approach 300 divided by five because this entire term is going to approach zero. 300 divided by five is equal to 60. So in the long run, there will be 60 chickens that get sick. So if I wanted to continue with my graph, I noticed that my scale is probably not the best. So let's say, first of all, my scale was never really great because 30 is definitely gonna be closer to here and 60 is gonna be somewhere up here. So 60 is the number of chickens that I expect as the limiting value for the actual um, epidemic. And so now what I have is, this is the beginning number of my chickens, this is the number of chickens at some point during the epidemic, and this is the number that I'm approaching. So I have some sort of a function that goes through these two points and approaches the horizontal asymptote. Now I haven't analyzed this model enough to know exactly the shape of the function, so maybe it's like this, or maybe it's more like this. So I can draw the graph that will really truly represent the situation. In fact, let me just draw a couple of different options that I can have, but I have enough of a sense of what is going on to at least have some idea of the very general shape that this epidemic function will follow. You can, of course, take this and analyze this further using the first and second derivative and so on in order to produce a more concrete graph, and I encourage you to do so. In this next application, we're going to take a look at the tooth growth in alligators. What we have here is a model to estimate the number of teeth at time t in days after incubation for alligator mississippiensis. And this function is given to us by the following. Notice the ladder of exponentials here. So it's e to power of some constant e to some other power. So we have two levels of powers of e here. First, let's explore the model a little bit. We're asked to find the number of teeth on alligator that hatched after 65 days. So recall, of course, that alligators actually come out of the eggs. So if it hatched after 65 days, after incubation, how many teeth does it have to begin with? 
So 65 days, we're going to simply plug 65 into our function. And again, being very careful, minding the fact that this t here is 65, but it's e to this power and then e to this entire power. If you plug that in carefully, you will get the result of 64 point, approximately 68. Now, of course, in terms of teeth, we can't have fractional amounts of them. So we can round up or down here and it will be approximately 64 to 65 teeth in 65 days. Next up, we're asked to find and interpret the limit as t goes to infinity of this function. So as before, t going to infinity, of course, signifies the fact that we're looking for law and term behavior, or in this case, for the number of teeth in an alligator as t goes off to infinity. So essentially, how many teeth will the alligator have as a grown um, animal? So let me plug this entire function into the limit and then start to analyze it. So I have e to power minus some constant times e to power minus some other constant. So I am going to analyze this inside out. I know that t goes off to infinity, which means that this power goes to minus infinity because I'm multiplying t by a negative number. That in turn means that e to this power, so e to the power of negative large number, goes off to zero. And now it becomes a little bit easier because now I have a number times zero. So this entire power will then approach zero. And therefore, e to this power will approach one. We're going to have 71.8 times 1, or overall 71.8. So that means as time goes on, the end behavior of this function, the horizontal asymptote, if you will, mathematically, will be 71.8. In terms of the actual content, that means that the number of teeth in an alligator will be approximately 71.8. Next up, we're asked to find and interpret the derivative at 10. 10 being days, so in 10 days. Let's start by doing some calculations. So I would like to find the derivative of n here. Notice that because I have such a complicated expression, I could actually apply logarithmic differentiation. But here, for the sake of doing things a little bit differently, I'm actually going to simply brute force my way through this derivative. So I'm going to take it as is. First of all, I have to decide what is my inside and what is my outside function. I have 71.8 times e to some power. So my outside function is this exponential, and my inside function is its entire power. But according to the chain rule, my first step is to take a derivative of the outside, which means this function. The derivative of e to any power is simply itself. So what I'm going to do is, to begin with, I am simply going to rewrite this entire function. So the derivative is itself, and in fact, let me note that so I don't forget where that came from, times the derivative of the inside. So now I have to actually take a derivative of this function. But this one's not so bad anymore. This one looks a little bit more familiar. It's a constant times e to some power. So we leave the constant alone, and then we take a derivative of e to the power, which is, of course, itself. If I can keep the constant straight here, 8, 5, times the derivative of its inside, which is this. So the derivative of that is going to be minus 0 0.0685. Excellent. Quite a few steps, but we managed to get there. Now, if I am going to compute n prime of t, all that involves is now plugging 10 in for t everywhere in the derivative. And what I'm going to get is point two. Four. So now let's think about the units. I took a derivative of n with respect to time. n is the number of teeth. t is time in days. So what I have here is teeth per day. So that means that in 10 days, the rate of growth of teeth of the alligator is approximately 0.24 teeth per day. Okay. Remember that the derivative means we're talking about the rate of growth. 
10 here will represent at which point we're computing it, and the number will actually correspond to the rate. So not only was it, is it positive, the alligator is getting approximately a quarter of a tooth every single day. Now, next up, we're going to actually try to sketch the graph of this thing. In order for us to sketch that, we would like to find the critical points, find when the function is increasing and decreasing, and in particular here, we're also asked to find the inflection point and describe its importance. We're given the first and second derivative for our convenience here, so let's start off by finding critical points. In fact, this is a good place for me to remind you that all the tools have already been developed and you can pause the video to get through this question by yourself before coming back to see the solution. So for the critical points, critical points are when the function is zero or when the function does not exist, or sorry, the function's derivative. So the derivative is zero when? Well, I have this expression here. So I have 44.068 times e to some really large power, and I'm wondering when that's equal to zero. Now recall that e to any power is always strictly positive. So this is always above the x-axis, it's always positive, it does not have x asymptotes, which means that this can never be zero, and of course this is just a number, so this whole expression can never actually be zero, and therefore this has no solutions. When does this not exist? Well, what are the types of numbers that I cannot possibly plug in in for t here? It's e to some power, so I will be able to plug in any single number I want. So this leads us to no solutions as well. This is a bit of an odd case. That means that we have no critical points. However, that does not change our approach. We will draw ourselves a number line, and we will put all critical points we found onto the number line. Well, we found none, so we're going to put none, which means that we're analyzing this entire line in one piece. But the rest of the analysis is exactly the same. So I can pick any number at all, put this into my derivative to figure out if it's positive or negative. Now again, the analysis of the derivative is easy here. It's e to some power, which is always positive, and it's multiplied by a positive number. So that means that my derivative is always positive, which of course means that my function is always increasing. And let's denote that conclusion, always increasing, because that is an important feature of its graph's shape. Now next up, of course, is the concavity analysis, the potential inflection points. So now I'm interested in when the second derivative is equal to zero or does not exist. So let's start with it being equal to zero. It's already in the simplified form here. So what I have is the second derivative is e to some power, right? I'm not gonna rewrite this. There are just some coefficients, some powers, and then I have this bracket. So 27.0472, this is what happens when you use real models and real data. The numbers get messy because real life is messy. I am interested when this is equal to zero. Now, as before, I'm actually going to use the exact same logic. e to any power is always positive. So that means that it itself can never be zero. This portion can never be zero. So the only way that this product is zero is if the bracket here is equal to zero. So this is my only option this is equal to zero, and if I solve for t here in a couple of steps that I'm going to skip because they're fairly straightforward um, in order to obtain the solution, t is going to be approximately 33.32. Now, for my other case, the second derivative does not exist, I will have, again, a similar logic to the first derivative. I have t's only in the powers of e, which means that I can plug in any number at all, so this yields no solutions. And then, as before, I draw myself a little number line, and I'm going to analyze what happens with my potential inflection points. 
Now in this case, I actually have a point to put in on the line, so approximately 33.32. I'm going to analyze the behavior of the derivative, of the second derivative, and then conclude something about the behavior of the function. So if I pick a number here, I plug it into my second derivative, I will also be able to do this in my head. This is always positive, so I really only have to think of a number and plug it into this bracket right here. Let's say I pick a number, I don't know, 0. 0 is always an easy number to use and to plug in. So if I plug in 0 for t, this entire thing is going to be 0, which means that this whole thing is going to be e to power 0, meaning it's 1. And so overall I have 27 minus 3, which is a positive number. And using similar logic, I can pick a very large number, plug it into here. This will make e to the very large power very big. And so this term will overtake the first term, resulting in the negative value overall. And you can, of course, plug in specific numbers to um, support my logic here. If the second derivative is positive, it means that the function is concave up. If the second derivative is negative, it means that the function is concave down, which means that this point is a true inflection point because concavity of the function actually changes at that point. Now, using all of this information, let's sketch a graph of this function. Notice, of course, that I can use some information that I found on the previous slide, and in particular, the fact that the long-term behavior in the long term, I have 71.8 as my horizontal asymptote or the maximal number of teeth that my alligator is going to have. So I know that my function is going to plateau at that point. Now, I have no critical points and the function is always increasing. So it's increasing up until that number. How it does so is something that the inflection points are going to help us and the concavity will tell us which way it goes. So at 33 days, so let's say somewhere here, I will have my inflection point. We can plug this number back into the function itself to figure out exactly how high it is, but I'm just going to keep it here as the inflection point. I'm not going to calculate the exact location of it in terms of the y value. What I know though is First of all, again, the function is always increasing. Up until that point, it's increasing in a concave up manner. And after that point, it's increasing in the concave down manner. So something along those lines. The one piece of information that I haven't quite considered here is the fact that my y and x-intercept is most certainly not going to be zero. So this is not zero. Let's say this is some height above the actual um, origin. I encourage you to look for the x and y-intercept and see exactly how high it is. Now, this is not the entire question. We were actually specifically asked not to only find the inflection point, but also describe its importance. What happens at the inflection point? What happens here is my tooth are growing at a certain rate, and now they're beginning to grow a little bit slower because the function is now, instead of rising towards, the asymptote starts plateauing to it. So at the inflection point, and that's going to be the case with all inflection points um, of these shapes of the function, so I'm going from concave up to concave down, the rate of growth is in fact maximal. This is the point where the tangent line is the steepest it's going to be. Because up until then, in the concave up manner, my tangent lines are getting steeper and steeper. They hit the steepest peak of it here and then they begin to plateau out. So at this point right here, the rate of growth of teeth is maximal. At the inflection point, rate of growth is maximal. And again, seeing this on the graph means that the tangent line at that point is the steepest. Now for our final application here, let's consider the exponential model of blood alcohol levels. So here we're told that after the consumption of 100 milligrams of alcohol, its concentration in bloodstream is modeled by this particular function. And this is measured in grams of alcohol per 100 milligrams of blood, where T is in hours after the initial alcohol consumption. We're going to assume that initial alcohol consumption happened and then no other alcohol has been consumed after that. The question here is, when does the peak blood alcohol concentration occur? 
It will not occur immediately after alcohol is consumed because it takes time for the alcohol to go from the stomach to the blood. And therefore, this function is actually going to model that absorption of the alcohol into the blood. And we're asked for when do we see the peak in the actual blood concentration of the alcohol. So let's take a look at what does the question ask mathematically. We have ourselves a function and we're asked for the peak, the maximum. And in fact, we're not asked for a local maximum, we're asked for the maximum overall. So what this is really after is the global maximum. Remember that the way to obtain a global maximum is to find critical points, find endpoints, and plug all of them back into the function itself to find which one is actually the highest number overall. So we will start by finding critical points. And that, of course, is obtained by setting the derivative of this function to be zero and not existing. I encourage you to pause here and go through this process by yourself. In fact, this entire question, once again, we have all the tools and the procedures are the same as they were for non-exponential functions. So you should be able to make your way through all of this by yourself. The hardest part is probably actually simplifying and solving with exponential functions. Uh, but be patient and you should get there. So let's take a derivative of this function. We can keep the brackets as is because 2 is simply a number. So I'm going to keep it factored outside and then take a derivative of each of the pieces of the inside separately. So for the first one, the derivative of the exponential function is itself times the derivative of the inside minus, and again, we have another exponential function, times the derivative of itself, times the derivative of the inside. So now, if I open up the brackets, what I'm going to get is minus 2.4 e to the negative 1.2t plus 3.6. Don't forget that this minus and this minus go together, and then 2 gets applied to all of the multiples of the inside. So I have minus uh, 1.8t in the exponent here. So for the critical points, I'm looking for when the derivative is equal to 0 and when the derivative does not exist. So it's equal to 0 when this equation is equal to 0. And there's a number of different ways you can solve it. One of them is to move the exponentials over to two different sides and then divide out by one of them. So for example, divide both sides by e to the minus 1.8t. Okay, this will allow you to cancel it on the right hand side and put them together on the left hand side. And after a few more steps, you will be able to apply logarithms in order to actually solve for t. t is going to come out being approximately 0.67. Remember, t is an hour, so this is about two thirds of an hour later. When does the derivative not exist? Well, the derivative is this function right here. t's are only present in the exponents of the exponentials, which means that we can plug any number in. So this particular case gives us no solutions. When we're looking for a global maximum, we're not interested in the first or second derivative analysis. We can simply find endpoints and plug those in together with critical points back into the function. So endpoints here is the beginning of the consumption and as t goes towards infinity. So as time goes on, what happens after that? So now that we have collected all of our uh, potentials for the global maximum, we're going to plug everything back in. So I'm going to compute the function at my critical, my one critical point, which is 0.67. I'm going to compute my function as 0, and I'm going to take a limit of my function as t goes towards infinity. If I plug in 0 0.67, I'm going to get approximately 0.3. And remember, this is in grams of alcohol per 100 milligrams of blood. If I plug in 0 back into my original function, what am I going to get? This is going to be 0. This is going to be 0. e to power 0 is 1. So I'm going to get 1 minus 1, which of course is 0. So overall, this is going to end up being 0. And similar logic reveals that the limit as t goes to infinity of my function is also going to be 0. So taking a look at these three numbers, which one is the highest? Well, that's easy enough to see that this number is the largest, which means that it is our global maximum. 
So in terms of our content context, peak alcohol concentration in the blood will happen in two thirds of an hour after the consumption of 100 milligrams of alcohol. So will occur 0.67 hours after initial consumption. Now again, this model, it's important to always remember the assumptions that your model has taken. This model assumes that you only had the 100 milligrams of alcohol and did not continue supplementing. And it also isn't actually necessarily matched to your body type or your metabolism. So you got to be careful about that. Taking a look at this problem mathematically, let us note, as I've already mentioned, that there's nothing really new here in terms of methods. If we're looking for global extrema, we're looking for critical points, so the derivative is being zero and the derivative not existing. We're looking for endpoints, and then we're plugging all of them in, and all we're doing at the last step is comparing the physical numbers, the if you were to draw this function, the actual heights of these different points. Finding one that is the highest produces the global maximum.